I am patient and community outreach manager for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in our mountain region, um, which is Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and Idaho. So quite a vast array of land. Um, I am in Denver though, so I've been working um, within kind of Colorado healthcare nonprofits for quite some time now. Um, I will be going over some of our resources and support. Um, I will I'll probably often say patients and caregivers, but often looped into that as survivors as well. Um, a lot of our programs survivors can access as well. Um, there's maybe just one or two that it, you have to be in um, consistent and current treatment. So let me make sure I'm doing the right screen. So good to everyone. Yep, perfect. Okay. Sure. Um, so I will start out kind of with our mission. Some of you already may be very familiar. I recognize some familiar faces here. Um, but our mission is to cure leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, and myeloma, and improve the quality of life of patients and their families. Um, and we kind of do this through three different pillars within LLS. So research, advocacy, and then support. Um, I'm gonna kind of focus on the support side since that is the area that I'm in, but a lot of the um, patients and caregivers and survivors that we serve are very involved in our advocacy team as well. Um, here in Colorado, we have an entire advocacy committee that works with um, and part, a member of the LLS staff and talks with state representatives and helps kind of move policy forward here, shares their stories. Um, they're a, a small but mighty and growing committee. So like I said, we'll focus kind of on the support side of things. Um, the first thing that I like to mention to everyone is our information resource center. Um, anyone can access this, not just a patient or their family, or um, I, I've called the information resource center. I know people in our community have as well. Um, this is kind of a one-stop shop for families to get information um, either about treatment or things in their uh, local communities and navigate LLS resources. Um, so a lot of people will call and say, you know, how do I get enrolled in a clinical trial or I need to get a second opinion. How do I go about doing that? And our information resource center is staffed with oncology social workers, nurses, health educators um, who can really kind of walk them through all of those steps. An offshoot of our Information Resource Center is our Clinical Trial Support Center. Um, so this is actually, the team has grown quite a bit over the last few years. Um, it's staffed with oncology nurses and the team helps patients um, or their family members through the entire clinical trial process. Um, so many people wanna be involved in clinical trials kind of like Nancy was talking about. Um, so they help and kind of inform them on what a clinical trial might look like and what they may actually qualify for. It's you know a really daunting task to go and look at what clinical trials might actually work for you and be able to decipher if you would be a good candidate or not. And so our team helps them kind of through all that process, gathers all the patient's information, looks at those clinical trials, and then gives that information back to the patient to talk with their healthcare provider. Um, our team doesn't enroll them in the clinical trial. We just give them the tools to have those conversations with their healthcare provider. Um, if they do enroll in a clinical trial, our team can help kind of overcome those obstacles of maybe financial need, or if they're traveling across the country, what does that look like? And then kind of follows them through their whole clinical trial process. And so you can see here, there's kind of a continuum of, of what our staff will do with them. Um, we've had instances where our clinical trial support center might contact a um, trial site and get more information to then better equip the patient. Um, so it's a lot of different things that our team does and we're really, really excited to have kind of a full robust team to help patients with this. Next, I know there's a lot of text on the slide, so I'm gonna go through each one of these, but there's also a link at the top to learn more about our financial aid programs. Um, that is how a lot of people first find LLS is that you know, we have many, many different financial aid programs that they can utilize. Um, and they can utilize all of these programs 
at the same time. It's not, you don't have to choose between one or the other. So first starting with patient aid, that is a one-time $100 stipend to any eligible blood cancer patient. And when we say eligible, we mean going through treatment, but we don't look at income at all. This is an easy one-time gift that anyone who's diagnosed with a blood cancer can receive. Um, next is our travel assistance program. This is a $500 stipend to eligible patients um, to help cover the cost of uh, travel, whether that's gas in the car, lodging, airfare, um, of everything around getting to a site for treatment. Um, and it doesn't matter how far of distance they're traveling. If they're going across the country or if they're going, you know, to UC Health, they can utilize this program. Um, it does have an income requirement. And on our website, we have a whole chart on how to determine if you fit into that category. Um, but this is a program that people can apply for um, year after year. And we actually have a Colorado specific fund that will be available in, man, I guess a week. Um, we had a very generous donor help us with our Colorado state travel fund. And so the person just has to have um, an address in Colorado, but they can travel to other states for care if that's what they're doing. Next, um, this is relatively new. Um, so we have a scholarship for blood cancer survivors. This provides up to $7,500 in assistance to cover tuition, whether it's to a vocational school, um, in-person, virtual, two-year, four-year, any kind of post-secondary education. Um, anyone who was diagnosed with a blood cancer at age 25 or younger can apply for this scholarship. Um, this year, our deadline is actually in two days. So if you know anyone who needs this and is really fast at writing an essay, they can still get their application in, but this will be a yearly scholarship that we offer to blood cancer survivors. Um, there's no kind of income cap on this one, um, but this is kind of the start of a lot of our new survivorship resources that we're trying to implement within LLS. Um, next is urgent need. So this is also a $500 stipend for eligible patients. Um, and it covers non-medical expenses. So kind of everything else that comes along with the diagnosis. So groceries, rent, utilities, um, sometimes even some dental work if um, the radiation that you're getting has caused you know, your, your teeth to decay. Um, you can utilize urgent need for our urgent need program for that. Um, and then lastly is our co-pay assistance program. This is, um, financial support to cover, you know, premiums, um, prescription drug costs, co-pays. We've actually added in a lot of testing now that is kind of covered under this. So x-rays, um, PET scans, MRIs, things like that. Our co-pay assistance is broken up by blood cancer diagnosis. And so um, you're able to, that's why it says some silos are open because some diagnoses are closed right now. Some are open, but you can go online and see kind of everything that we cover and what is also open. Emma, there's a question, if I may. Oh, yes. I can't see the chat. So, yeah, go ahead, Carla. Give it to me. Um, for the scholarship for mm -hmm. um, post-secondary education, may they be over 25 years of age, but diagnosed under age 25? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we really wanted to capture a lot of the survivors that maybe had a pediatric cancer that are now living, you know, potentially with late-term effects. Um, but yes, they can be over the age of 25. And once I'm done, before I hop off to my next meeting, I'll put a link to our scholarship page in the chat. It's a little hard to find on our website, um, but there's also additional resources and then information about internships and careers on there as well. Wonderful. And there's another question. Mm -hmm. um, is there an income eligibility requirement for the urgent need program? Yes. So the, for urgent need copay and our travel assistance program, um, there is an income requirement. I believe it's 500% over the poverty level. Um, there is a chart and I'll see if I can find it real quick that says, you know, how many people are in your household? This is the income you can have so they can easily determine. Thank you. Yeah, of course. 
Um, nutrition consultations is another thing in the last few years that we've started to do for patients. Um, this is for patients and caregivers and survivors of not only blood cancer, but all cancer types um, to get free one-on-one -on -one nutrition consultation with our registered dietitian. So she can talk with them through meal planning, maybe managing some side effects, um, healthy eating habits and strategies. Um, she is a lovely woman and kind of a one woman show and she's been doing um, all of these one on one nutrition consultations. So you can actually go to our website and either schedule one for yourself or if you're a healthcare provider and you talk with someone who needs it. Um, you can go on and sign them up for a consultation as well. And kind of along with our nutrition consultations is our health manager app. Um, so this is a kind of a one-stop shop where you can track medications, side effects, um, food intake, water intake. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a blood cancer to utilize this app. It doesn't ask at any point during the registration process. I've downloaded the app. That's how I know that. Um, there's a portion in there to write down notes for a healthcare provider because, you know, I'm sure we've all been in there where we're we have our questions ready to go, but we don't have them written them down and then we forget it all once we're in there. So there's a there's a place for that as well. And then lastly about the app, um, you can actually give, if you're a patient or a survivor, you can give your caregiver access to your account. So from their own device, they can go into kind of your account and maybe put in some of the food intake or meal planner recipes, things like that. Next are kind of our support resources that we offer to um, kind of all patients and survivors and even some caregivers. Um, the first is our first connection program. So this is a program for um, patients or family members to connect with one of our peer volunteers to talk with someone who's you know, been through it before and they can kind of have um, similar experiences. And so we try to match, you know, on whatever is important to that patient or caregiver. Um, if someone's maybe, you know, dealing with, I had someone the other day who's dealing with um, staying on disability and he's been out of his cancer journey for two years, but is still having a lot of those um, late and long-term effects. And, you know, what are kind of things that he has to know? And so I was able to connect him with someone else in Colorado who has had a similar situation. Um, so people can request these on their own. Um, providers or myself can submit them for people as well, these requests for our first connection program. Um, next is our local family support groups. So we have three there in Colorado, one in Denver, Boulder, and the Springs. Um, those are in person, but right now all of our support groups are virtual, and so we're just doing two a month right now. Um, but this is for, again, patients or caregivers, anyone kind of who wants to attend, even we have survivors that attend, um, to just meet other people in the area. And our groups are facilitated by healthcare professionals um, in Colorado. And then online chats. So think of um, like instant messenger. We have different diagnoses on different days of the week um, where they can just chat kind of over computer on instant messenger with other people. And it's moderated by one of our oncology social workers from our information resource center. Um, and then lastly is LLS community. So this is like a social networking site where you can create a profile, post about yourself, share your story, um, comment on other people's posts, and then also join groups. And so we have a survivorship group specifically that survivors can join and um, just chat with others all across the country. It's not just within Colorado. So Emma, if Sandy and Nancy and Vicki and others wanted to share information about their groups with some of these support groups, what, what do you recommend? Because maybe somebody who's finished CAR T or stem cell transplant has the need for Reiki or healing touch or wants to get outside or wants to do therapeutic art. Mm -hmm. There's a few different ways. Um, so we have within our support groups, honestly, just kind of get in contact with me. And we haven't done it much in virtual support groups, but in person, we would have someone come and, and share kind of their organization and what they can do to kind of help our population. 
um, but also we have kind of an external resource guide as well that obviously me and then my volunteers who reach out to our patients and survivors have access to. So they can look, you know, if someone mentions that they are, are looking for kind of other resources that maybe LLS doesn't provide, they can go to that document. So when I send the slides that you will so kindly share, um, may I ask people with many of these organizations to reach out to you? Absolutely, yes. Because that's a, a big part of this task force is the networking and trying to connect with people. So mm -hmm. maybe people don't know about what Sandy can do with her amazing organization. So that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And it makes me think too, you know, and I'll get to it, I think on the next slide, we do local education programs as well. And are always looking for, you know, different speakers or different topics to cover. Um, I didn't have one in the mountain region, but a different region had an integrative medicine um, talk. So I would love, yeah, all those connections and any resources. And if you guys are willing to ever share that on a support group or an education program, I'd love that. We have the best of the best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions, Carlin? No, thank you. Of course. Um, and then lastly, our education resources. So we have a podcast that's hosted by a few of my um, LLS coworkers. And we chat with um, patients, survivors, caregivers, healthcare providers, um, about different topics. Um, they come out about once every other week. Um, and so it's easy to find in the Apple Store or in Google Play. It's just the bloodline with LLS. Um, we have quite a bit of episodes now, so they're really, really interesting and a good listen. Um, webcasts. So these we were doing these long before we were, you know, doing Zoom um, education programs, but these are nationally recorded webcasts that people can either join live or go back and see kind of our collection of recorded webcasts on our website, tips on survivorship, caregiving. Um, COVID obviously was a really big one this last, these last two years, I guess now. Um, so those are all listed on our website. And then like I'd mentioned, local education programs. So I host um, a handful in the region every year. And then we also have a blood cancer conference um, in April that we do. This next year, it will be virtual. And so we have different speakers on um, different diagnoses, but then we always have a few psychosocial sessions as well. Um, and then I wanted to highlight this. One of the things that honestly drew me to LLS when I first started was the amount of information that we provide um, for everyone to just be educated about their, their journey and their diagnosis. So there's obviously ones that are specific for blood cancer, but then there's ones about cancer and your finances or managing stress. Um, we have a palliative care handout online and these can be downloaded or you can order a hard copy to your house for free. Um, there's tons of, of good information and big booklets on there. So feel free to poke around and, and honestly get anything kind of ordered to you or to anyone that might find it helpful. I also recommend these resources for um, anyone who maybe has a family member who doesn't quite understand their diagnosis or, um, you know, they don't really want them to just Google what type of leukemia they have. They can utilize our books to make sure they're getting correct information. And um, it's a pretty easy reading level as well. So all of these resources are great, um, but the best way to kind of get them all to a patient is our patient referral form on our website. It's under the researchers and healthcare professionals tab, but anyone can submit this form even the patient or the survivor themselves can submit this form. Um, by doing this, they get connected with our information resource center and then our, our IRC or information resource center calls them. So it's kind of one thing off of their plate to do. Um, and anyone who connects with our information resource center also gets a follow-up call from either me or someone on my team here locally. So this is the easiest way to make sure we're kind of covering all of these bases because there's a lot of resources um, and our website 
has all of these resources, but it can also be pretty daunting to, to look through. I did want to highlight real quick also just resources that we have for healthcare providers specifically. Um, we have, like I said, its own tab on our website next to the patient and caregivers tab. And within our resources for healthcare professionals, you know, we're always trying to kind of beef up our programs that we have. Um, one on demand program that we have right now is our Staying Connected program. This is for um, school professionals to kind of help them, you know, reintegrate students maybe after their cancer treatment. Um, and what's the best way to, you know, facilitate learning and understanding among the, the school and the student population. This um, on-demand course, you can get a continuing education credit for. And then we also have a bunch of other CE and CME programs on our website that are kind of already recorded and can be done in, in your own time. Um, and then lastly, we have a podcast for healthcare providers. So it goes a little deeper into the science behind it. We get providers all across the country to kind of talk either on certain diagnoses or like again, COVID-19 has been really prevalent or upcoming treatments. Um, so if you know any healthcare providers who want a little more in-depth podcast, um, treating blood cancers is the name of that one. Um, and then lastly, here is my information. Um, please reach out if you have any questions, obviously, about what I presented, but even past that, you know, if, if you have someone that you're working with and you're not sure if we can help out or not, shoot me an email because, um, you know, it, again, our website can be hard to navigate through, so I can kind of either find it real quick for you or give you an answer or connect you with someone in our community um, that might have that resource for someone. That's all I got. Any other questions? There's a comment. Um, as a survivor and in the medical profession, I see a huge need to include in the patient care algorithm to see a social worker and financial representation at the beginning and end of treatment. Absolutely. We, um, that's something that I've talked a lot about with either newly diagnosed patients that kind of contact our organization and, and they're curious about some other resources and, um, I say, have you connected with a social worker at your facility? And they say, well, I've, I don't think so. I have no idea. And so we, we always try to advocate for um, patients to ask for those resources because sometimes they're not often just given. But I think that is something that would benefit many people if it changed, if it was kind of just routine that they got to see, you know, the financial navigator and the social worker at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, we, we know how much the vet bill will be tomorrow morning, but when you think about what goes into treatment or CAR T or stem cell transplant, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Emma. We'll stop recording now. You did a fantastic job and we're so glad you're here. Of course. And I actually have to hop to another meeting, but let me put those 